Hey everyone, welcome back to Med School Moose. This is going to be USMLE Step 1 High Yield Images Part 8. This has been uh, my most popular video series, so I wanted to go ahead and make another video for you guys. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to mention my podcast again really quickly by the same name, Med School Moose. Um, I use the podcast to talk about life in the medical field through students and physicians and, and other professionals that, that work in it. Um, to talk about a lot of different topics. I think it's important for anyone considering or uh, already going into a career in medicine. Um, and you can listen to that on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, or several other places where you may listen to podcasts. Um, I have the links in the description below, and I would really appreciate it. You know, give it a listen. Let me know what you think. If you have any feedback, if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, please let me know. Um, it really does make a difference, and thank you so much in advance for the support. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with these high yield images. This first one is going to be a picture of Aspergillus fumigatus, and the important things to note here are mentioned by the arrows. So the thick arrow arrows right here are going to show the uh, hyphae, which are branching at acute angles, and you can see that here. These are acute angles. And then the thin arrows are going to show the septation. So you can kind of see these lines going down these septations really clearly here. Uh, one way that I like to remember the acute angle branching is acute starts with an A, as does aspergillus. Um, so that's an easy way to remember that. It is acute angle branching hyphae. This next image is an example of Schiller Duval bodies. And these are glomerulus-like structures that are seen in yolk sac tumors, also called endodermal sinus tumors. So if you were to just look at this by itself, it kind of does resemble a glomerulus. Clearly not the same structure, but it has that same basic shape. Um, so if you see something like that in a question, you want to be thinking about Schiller-Duval bodies and yolk sac tumors. This next picture is an example of asbestos bodies, and we see a nice long one really clearly right here. This is obviously something that is seen in asbestosis, uh, and these are also called ferruginous bodies, so be on the lookout for that term as well. Uh, they're seen in the lung, and they resemble dumbbells, and you can kind of see that here with this narrow rod-like structure in the center, and then the two spheres on the end of it resembles a dumbbell uh, and seen in asbestosis. This picture, this is a glomerulus, uh, and this is an example of membranous nephropathy, uh, and this is an H&E stain, and the, the notable thing here is this thick outer basement membrane. So if you see a basement membrane that's thick like this, you want to be thinking about membranous nephropathy. This next picture is an example of medial longitudinal fasciculus, the structure in the brain. I have seen questions that will show this structure, or show an image like this, and just straight up ask what is the structure that the arrow is pointing to. It'll, it'll be that simple, and it's a really easy question to get right. So there are um, questions that'll just ask you to identify the structure, but an important thing to note here is that damage to the MLF can cause internuclear ophthalmoplegia, or horizontal gaze palsy. So they might also ask, you know, what is the effect of damage to this area, and you would have to know not only that it is the MLF, but you would have to know that damage to the MLF will cause internuclear ophthalmoplegia. This is an example of malaria seen on a uh, blood smear. And really the, the prominent structure that we're looking at are these rings here. These are the trophozoites, which can be seen within red blood cells. So if you see something like this, really nothing else is going to look like this. But if you see a blood smear and you see this structure inside what looks like a red blood cell, you want to be thinking about malaria. This next image is post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis seen under electron microscopy. And the prominent structure here that we want to look at is pointed out by these white arrow arrows. These are the sub-epithelial humps that are commonly associated with post-strep glomerulonephritis. Very, very high yield to know that term, sub-epithelial humps, as well as what they look like under EM. Um, because they love to ask questions about the different glomerulopathies on USMLE and COMLEX as well, so be aware of that. This next image is an example of another glomerulonephritis, and this one is rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. Um, the, the important thing to note here is this big crescent-like structure of the glomerulus on the right, kind of looks like a moon, 
as you can see here. And that is why it also has the name of crescentic glomerulonephritis. So be aware of that as well. Uh, it is important to note that this crescent is composed of fibrin and macrophages, not collagen. So just know that if you see this image and it looks like kind of a moon shape, you want to be thinking about rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. What is this area composed of? It's going to be fibrin and macrophages. This next image is pretty straightforward, but I mean, when you're taking the test and it's been a couple hours in, uh, you might get a little tired and get tripped up. This is just a chest x-ray of low bar and pneumonia. Um, this will probably come with a clinical vignette, so just be aware of that. Don't, you know, necessarily run off quickly and, and think about zebras. Uh, sometimes it's just a simple answer, and I just wanted to show this because I think it is important just, just to keep it in your mind that, you know, it's low bar pneumonia. It's a simple diagnosis, but just be aware. Don't, don't exclude it. You know when you're deep in the exam. This is an example of a uh, trichomonas vaginalis, um, pretty unique shape, nothing else really looks like this so it is easy to identify and the important thing to note with this is that it is the causative agent of trichomoniasis in females. Remember trichomoniasis is the disease characterized by a foul smelling green discharge from the vagina and the treatment for that is also high yield. It is metronidazole or flagyl and also important to note is this treatment must be given to both the patient and the partner. Otherwise, they'll keep passing the infection back and forth chronically. So this image here, trichomonas vaginalis, causes trichomoniasis. What do we treat trichomoniasis with? Metronidazole for the patient and for their partner. This next image is an example of hairy cell leukemia. Important things to know about this is that is a mature B cell tumor, B cell tumor. So make sure you know that. And it also stains trap positive. So know that as well. And, you know, it's pretty easy to tell here that it's hairy cell leukemia because it has this kind of hairy appearance to it. Pretty distinct compared to other cells. This next one uh, is a little bit tougher and also a little bit lower yield, but I did want to include it. This is an example of cavernous hemangioma. Um, it's a common benign liver tumor. Um, and, and you probably won't see it on the exam. If you do, it'll be a picture just like this, and you'll have to identify it that way. Again, a little bit lower yield, but I do want to include these things because there may be that one-off question that someone gets, um, and, and I want you to have at least seen this picture so you might have a familiarity with it. This next one is an example of seboric keratosis, and the important thing to look at here are these world pseudocysts that really... Uh, are close to the surface and they really give away the diagnosis. So if you see something like this, you want to be thinking about seboric keratosis. This picture is also an example of seboric keratosis and we're looking at it from the surface now on the actual patient. Um, and it has this classic stuck on appearance as people like to describe it. It resembles a wart and it is also important to note that it is non-cancerous. So stuck on appearance and non-cancerous. The way that I like to remember that is seboric keratosis starts with an S and a K, and the word stuck also starts with an S and a K, so I remember it that way. This, on the other hand, is an example of actinic keratosis, also called solar keratosis, and, you know, the description here is, is clearly different from seboric keratosis. This is a crusty, scaly kind of appearance. It doesn't look stuck on. It doesn't have that dark brown color generally. Um, and this is a precursor for cancer. It's a precursor for squamous cell carcinoma. So definitely know the difference between seboric keratosis and actinic or solar keratosis. Solar, obviously, because it can be associated with prolonged sun exposure. This is an example of a megakaryocyte. And I include this because I have seen questions that will just show the histology of the cell and they'll ask what is the function, which is pretty straightforward. It is um, making platelets, but if you don't know what the megakaryocyte looks like, it's an unfortunately easy question to get wrong. So just be familiar with what a megakaryocyte looks like. This is an example of hemoglobin C crystals seen on a blood smear. Um, and just like the previous picture, I have seen uh, images or questions that will show you this picture and they'll ask what that structure is. So it's a hemoglobin C crystal. A couple important things to note about this, it has very low solubility and therefore it increases blood viscosity uh, and it can shorten red blood cell life. As you can imagine, a thick structure like this 
bouncing around in the blood can easily damage red blood cells. So just know what it looks like and that it can damage red blood cells and shorten their lifespan. This is an example of a crew cut appearance of the skull on x-ray. And what this is indicative of is hematopoiesis, uh, which occurs at abnormal sites. So a couple of conditions that this is seen in are sickle cell anemia and thalassemia. So this crew cut appearance, as we see of the skull right here, indicative of hematopoiesis at abnormal sites. And what conditions is that seen in? It's seen in sickle cell anemia and thalassemia. This is also a pretty straightforward picture. Most medical students are going to know this. This is an example of a cataract, as we can see in the right eye here. Pretty easy to identify, but I do want to include it because I don't want people to get tripped up. Um, important things to note about cataracts, they are painless and often bilateral. In this case, it is unilateral, but they are often bilateral. And it is a, this clear opacification of the lens that decreases vision. Um, there are some important risk factors to know. Obviously, increasing age is the most well-known one. But some other ones that I want to mention include smoking, uh, excessive alcohol use, prolonged corticosteroid use, trisomies, so if a patient has Edwards syndrome or Patau syndrome or Down syndrome, they might try to make the association with an increased risk for cataracts. And the final um, risk factor that I want to mention is the torch infections, most prominently rubella. So those are all important uh, and usually lesser known risk factors of cataracts, but still high yield. And I believe this is the last picture. This is an example of corneal arcus. We can see this um, change in color right around the arc of the cornea here. And what that is, is that's representative of lipid deposits in the cornea due to hypercholesterolemia. Um, this is very common in the elderly. It can occur in children as well, but it is common in the elderly. And when it is seen in that population, it is called arcus senilis, like senile for old people. So just know this association, this kind of whitish ring around the cornea, corneal arcus associated with hypercholesterolemia. Okay, and that is the end of this video. I know it was a little faster than some of the other high yield images videos I've done in the past, but hopefully not too fast. Thank you so much for watching. Please be sure to subscribe, to give me a like, give me a comment, suggestions, feedback. I appreciate all of it. Thank you for watching and good luck with your studies.